This is interesting. An inside look at Hogwarts Legacy's Unreal Engine extensions four hours ago. My name is Jose Vigeta from Avalanche Software, uh, one of the makers of the Hogwarts Legacy game. I'm coming here to tell you a little bit about uh, the inside look at the Hogwarts Legacy and how we extended the Unreal Engine. Uh, we are a studio based in Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, we uh, shipped the Hogwarts Legacy in multiple platforms. I will say, uh, I've told you guys this before, but I, I've i been so nervous about Warner Brothers screwing this up and turning the next game into like a live service mess or trying to do some BS with that. That so, uh, there's I, couple presentations that we I signed up for like job listing notifications. So they send me an email whenever they have a new job posting. So if they ever hire a guy or are looking to hire a guy with live service experience, I get notified of that. And so far, nothing. They've hired a lot of character artists, a lot of like gameplay programmers and stuff like that. They haven't hired anybody with regard to like uh, making an online store or anything like that. They haven't done any of that, which is very good. If they ever do that, we will find out. Again, my name is Jose Vigeta. We presented uh, the Unreal Fest 2023. Uh, we did a, an inside look at developing the cross-platform open world uh, in Unreal Engine uh, by Rob Nelson and myself and Eric Brown that is in the audience over here. He did the extending of the Unreal Engine to create a story text. So if you want to go deep dive on the uh, Horror's Legacy, it's a great place to check it out. A uh, quick uh, info about our game uh, is uh, we developed this from the PC. Uh, we did a Steam, Steam Deck, Epic Game Store build. Uh, we also shipped it on PS5, Xbox Series X and X. We also uh, developed it for the PS4 and Xbox One. And then uh, we shipped it on Nintendo Switch. It's an action RPG single player game, uh, five years of development, and it localized around 14 languages. So one of the first advice I have is about how do you go about to make an Unreal game engine? So, uh, game. So the best advice is first find the real way, embrace the real way, find out how uh, they do the uh, all the data tables, how they do the actors. Look at the editor tools and workflows. Um, we use world composition, landscape tools. We use Niagara, as you can see from all those pictures over here. All the VFX were done by Niagara for spells and emergent magic. We use chaos physics for destruction, ragdoll, and cloth. And I'll show a little bit of that later on. And then we have extensive platform support, but there are times where you have to extend the Unreal Engine. So here's some few of the extensions that we did. Uh, we use Python uh, validation tools to validate the assets from textures to static meshes. We develop our own quest editor, and we'll show that a little bit. Character creator, and then a physics scene viewer, master tick throttle, a skin effect system, and a render visualizer debugging modes, and story tech editor tools, story graph and scenery. And I will show some examples of those as well. Jeez. We have an animation architect, and then we leverage the SQLite database. Does it make you uh, does it make you appreciate game developers <laughs> a little bit more when you're like, holy crap? So here's uh, the first one we're gonna talk about is a mission tech. So we had two major things that we did is a mission quest editor plugin. It's an extension of the Real Engine, and then we did also an automation for daily captures. So in here we're gonna play it out the life of an a mission designer at Avalanche. So in this case, he loads the game, he's playing the editor, he's gonna try to uh, kick off a mission that he's working on, he's already loaded the whole environment. He decides now to, to launch the, the quest editor. The quest editor is accessible from the Windows uh, section and then now you get exposed to the whole system. In here, you will see a variety of missions. He's trying to find his mission. The mission is a Fig one, is a Professor Fig that is the main uh, professor on the storyline. And then in here, you can start going through all your tasks. You can set up checkpoints. You can actually find the, the character that you want to bring in. In this case, he's trying to set up uh, a fig into our game. He now is, is trying to set up a scheduling. You can schedule any way you want it. You know, if he needs to approach you to the office, whatever it might be. And then not only that, then you can say, okay, well, I'm going to be working on a, on a subsection of the mission. So he can jumpstart the level in whatever place he wants. And all this is being powered by a SQL-like database. So as he is making any these changes, then he can actually uh, write to database. So he hit play mission, and now he jumps into the game exactly where he needs to be, and now he's going to play and then see how it goes. So in this case, he's going to uh, approach the, the start of his mission, that is uh, meet Professor Fig at his office. So he, he approaches the mission marker and then interacts. Ah, there you are. Hello, sir. You'll be pleased to know that I worked on my defensive magic with Professor Hecate. So I hear. She tells me you've taken rather well to your new wand. You might there's just, it's so modular and crazy. Like there's just, you pull this up. Yeah, pull it up. Open up a new window. It's fine. 
It's wild. Swordfish Master, doesn't the David Zaslav live service direction explain a lot of the Mortal Kombat 1 decisions? Like the content drip fee, $10 fatalities. It's $70 game and a lot of the network issues. Yeah, I think so. I think so. it also explains it also explains like uh, all of the crap with with Suicide Squad and all that. The question is just whether Hogwarts is an exception to that because Hogwarts Legacy was such an outrageous success. Are they going to try and do that same thing with the sequel? You guys know me like I tend to get a little annoyed when people just throw out well corporate greed, corporate greed as the explanation for absolutely everything. Often it's like. In my view, greed is when you have enough and you take more, you know, like it's not even that you, you like, you don't need more, right? That to me is greed. When you go to the, the sufficient level and then you step beyond that, that to me is greed. But I think with, with a lot of the time, like people look at something like Ubisoft or, or, uh, EA or somebody like that or Capcom and they'll be like, look, they're doing day one DLC or they're selling microtransactions or this or that multiple editions of the game. See, it's corporate greed. And that I don't think is actually often the case with a lot of these huge games. I don't put it in the greed category. I put it in the mismanagement category because they have to sell those microtransactions just to break even. I mean, we've, all, we've already talked about how if you're selling a game like um, in Avatar Frontiers of Pandora, for example, you spent $200 million making it or more, probably more when you factor in marketing and everything. And just to break even, you have to sell like four to 5 million copies at full price, or you have to sell like, uh, once it goes on sale, you probably have to sell more like seven, eight, nine million copies. And one of the ways you can help alleviate that stress to sell that many copies, because that's outrageous, is to sell DLC and stuff for 10 bucks here, five bucks there. And that helps boost up the average price spent per, per user, which can help you break even faster. So for me, like that stuff, I wouldn't put into the corporate greed category because I don't think that like they're not breaking even on Avatar day one and then everything else is just straight into the pocket. They're just desperately trying to break even. So shall we proceed? Fig, I have work for you, come. Headmaster, I'm with a student and my schedule Your is... schedule will wait indefinitely, as will your student. I would think that after all the trouble you caused me with Osric, you'd be eager to make amends. My office, five minutes. That man is exasperating. The constant fade blacks still drive me crazy. I will insist on that. Unfortunately, our trip to the restricted section will have to wait a bit longer. But, Professor... We have no choice. It would be unwise to provoke our illustrious headmaster further. I shall find you when I've completed whatever toils I must endure. So, at this point, uh, the player gets control. Um, you know, in this case, he already had the cinematic, the conversation, the setup. Now, um, the mission designer wants to move to the next step. So instead of being able to play through the whole process, he decides to teleport the player. He moves himself to whatever the location. As you can notice, we're playing the editor. We have not left the editor at all. We interacted with all the assets loaded, all our environments being loaded uh, behind the scenes, and then he can just finish the, the mission. And in this case, he needs to meet Sebastian Salo, the NPC, and then he stops. The other area that we did a, a mission is called the automation for daily captures. Like, it's just crazy. A lot of these tools, you have to like edit things in completely separate applications and then save them to different, different lists and stuff. It's just, it's crazy how blue So as we go is. through here, you will notice that we're going to do a lot of uh, testing over here. You can actually load in the character. You can change the background. In this case, we want to test how the ropes on uh, the physics work. So you can see that he moved from idle to sprint and run. You can change and do multi-region material parameters. I can change the silk component of the tie. I can change the color if I wanted to. And then you can really customize however you want. So this is the main. It's funny because the character creator they give the player is basically just the same one that they're using to make the NPCs in the game. Like they just make that and then like, yep, that's good. We'll just use it. Does this allows you to to not only ch uh, change your outfit and put whatever you outfit you want, you can change the wind direction, you can change the speed and, um, of the of the wind and see how well the robe is holding up. In the case this is an standing uh, test, 
we're going to change the direction and then change the speed. As you can see, the direction of the wind is coming from northwest, and then we see how well the, the simulation is holding up. We have all the visualizers to make sure that the physics asset was built right. And then you can move the directions and then show your sim cloth as well. So that's a simulated sim cloth that is driving the renderable uh, piece behind it. Now, this is a great uh, holodeck where you can just not only see um, the, the physics at work, but you can also see it at the different avatar mechanics. You, know, you can just go and see you jumping on ledges, climbing, climbing ladders. So you can really exploit and see how well the, the physics are holding up. All right? So it's a good way to make sure that it's battle tested, the physics, and to see if we have any adjustments needs to be done to the physics assets. Now I still insist, I, I much prefer physics stuff, like cloth physics, way more way more than like adding another dial for ray tracing like take ray tracing away i don't really care give me silky smooth physics sim for cloth for smoke for grasses oh oh man i love it because it's something you can actually like it's tangible you can see it in the game world and it it, it can even make you way more immersed than i think if the reflections are just uh, you know sharper i greatly prefer it greatly 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 prefers it i prefer steven luke's luke stevens is just a live service game it's true just another one just another one now not only we have to deal with that character in a standing position but we also have to uh, handle it with running and walking or whatever it might be but in our game, we have more than just a, a player on the, uh, running around, like, like you will see here. We ha also have uh, uh, brooms and mounts, and we'll show you in a second right now. So you can actually jump in your broom, and we have a special system where we keep the cloth really well protected around the broom with no interpenetrations going into the, on it. So you can mount and dismount. We also have a, a ground mount. So he's, uh, riding, she's riding now the grab horn. It's one of our mounts that we have, and you can just w walk around with it and see how well the, the physics asset is actually uh, been behaving on the back of the grab horn on it. And you can see how it jumps off and comes out. But not only the mounts on the ground, we have mounts that you can actually fly as well. So not only you can just walk it, but then what happens when you take off? So we want to make sure that the physics are still holding up. Now you're going to have larger wind speeds, uh, different directions of, of, of the wind conditions. So we want to make sure that the, all the cloth pieces that the player can uh, get dressed, that it looks right. And then not only uh, during flight, but also on the ground, and we come in and out of mount and dismount out of it. So it was a very important tool that we needed to make sure that the physics assets look correctly on it. And now this is mounting, and then you're good to go. Now switching gears a little bit to the cinematic story tech team on it. It's still just crazy. That game, if you've not played it, that game is just huge. It's just massive. It's wild that all of that stuff is in the game. Cause like, it's not that common that you play a game. You're like, okay, surely that's all they've got. And then there's even more. And then there's even more. And with, with this, it's like, it just keeps getting crazier. It's like, yeah. And we got the room of requirement. Yeah. You can just totally customize it. If you want to build like your own little, uh, little laboratory, you can do that. If you want to basically create an animal farm, you can do that, whatever. It's wild. The only thing it didn't have that I think a lot of people were expecting was Quidditch. But I think we all, I mean, it's pretty much confirmed the, that it's not in the game because they're going to be doing a live service Quidditch game. So they're just going to, they're just going to do that. There's just so much stuff that goes into this stuff. It's outrageous. He took my thing.